it's another context, and like the, the word Elohim is being used. Now, the book of Hebrews is very interesting, written to Messianic Jews, and it's written in Greek. And actually, the book of Hebrews quotes not the Hebrew Old Testament, it's quoting the Greek Old Testament. Now, this is really interesting. And so, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, especially, when they quote Old Testament scriptures that use Elohim, and our, by the way, our Bible is translated, the Old Testament is translated from the Hebrew text, the Old Testament. And that's why you'll notice a difference between New Testament quotes and Old Testament quotes on certain words. So, here it's got God's. And other, other text contexts, it's got gods. Elohim's been translated as gods, but in the book of Hebrews, it translates it angels. Okay, you're following my, my story here. So, by the way, apart from Yahweh, every other god is a is an fallen angel. Like Baal was a fallen angel. Moloch is a fallen angel. All of the gods of the ancient Egyptians are fallen angels. They're demons. So this is the thing. Um, we get an understanding now when, when we talk about the gods of the nations. Here is, here is the Lord God in his great assembly and he's surrounded by all the other gods. He, there is Baal, there is Moloch, there is all of these other gods. Ra, the sun god, and whatever other spirit would be called a god. They're all there in this assembly together with the good angels. Um, so heaven's assembly or the council of God is actually made up of two like two opposing councils. There's two types. There's, there's like uh, Lucifer's council, which are all the accusers. They're all these ones that are in rebellion against uh, the true purposes of God. Um, and they've got schemes and strategies uh, that they're working with. These are called the powers and the principalities. Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ultimately, we don't fight people, but we fight against powers and principalities. Powers and principalities are these gods that surround God on his throne. Together with now the archangels like Michael and Gabriel, they're of this council. Now, the true prophets of God enter into this council because Jesus, our advocate, Presides over this council. That's his council chamber. That's that's his group of angelic beings. Okay, Satan's over this group. False prophets and people who have false uh, understandings. And when we as Christians move into deception and we start to represent not Jesus the Advocate, but we represent Satan the Accuser, Pharisees were actually listening to this council. Are you following what's going on here? Okay, now in the story of Job, Satan comes into the law court of God and he's actually doing a, a couple of different things here. Hope you don't mind my artistic talent. <laughs> Not the best of pictures, but it's, I'm trying to give you some visual to understand what I'm talking about with this. Okay, so here is Satan, and he's, he's going to accuse, okay? But he has two strategies. Satan is really sneaky, Yes. okay? It's like he's, like he's a boxer, and you know, boxers have two fists, and they're going to punch left, right, left, right, and they have all different combinations. Well, Satan has two strategies in how he attacks us. You've got to understand this. For us, to, for us to be real prophets and speak into people's lives, the counsel of God, and to understand and discern in situations what's going on. So he comes with accusations against us, and even accusations to us against others. So he'll, he'll, he'll accuse our father and our mother and our pastor and, and, you know, and, and the church. He loves accusing the church. Revelation 12, he accuses the brethren day and night. Um, because he wants us to be declared guilty. Because in the law court of God, God is righteous. Did you know God is also righteous with the devil? That's what the story of Job's about. Study scripture. God is righteous in how he deals with every living being. 
God isn't righteous with you and unrighteous with the devil. No, no. God's righteous. He can't be unrighteous. So when Satan has true accusation, God, as a righteous judge, must listen and he must agree because the law of God that God created, God cannot break his own law. He's got to be righteous or right with his own law. So when Satan has a true accusation... God must listen to it. And so, you know, Satan says, well, they've sinned and they've not repented. They've broken your law. And the scripture declares, you know, uh, if you're going to break the laws of God, then you come under judgment. And God says, you are right, Satan. And then Satan says, I want uh, authority now to bring judgment into that Christian life, into that church. Because they're breaking your law. And then God, as a righteous judge, says, okay, I have to do this. Okay, so Satan's other trick is he is a tempter. Mm. <coughs> he will tempt us to sin. Mm. So what he does is he, he has all sorts of strategies to deceive us into sinning. And so he'll say, oh, everybody does it. It's okay, God's a God of love and mercy and grace, so you can, you can sin and you'll get away with it. It's only a little sin. Please sin. And so he's coming with temptation to sin, but his agenda is evil because he wants you to sin so that you are guilty, so he can accuse you and bring a judgment into your life. Do you follow that? That's why in Jeremiah chapter 22, as we looked at last week, and, and, and the Lord was rebuking the false prophets who've never stood in his counsel. And he said the false prophets were saying to those in Israel that were breaking God's law, you know, it's okay, you're one of God's covenant people. Uh, he loves you and he will bless you. To those that were half-hearted, to those that were living in sin, and it's like the false prophets are going, it's, it's all right because God is a God of blessing. He will bless you. They're declaring peace, peace, blessing, blessing mm-hmm. over people who are living in unrepented sin. Mm-hmm. And so what they're doing is now they're encouraging people to move into deeper unrepented sin so their guilt will increase. When their guilt increases, Satan gets more legal right to bring judgment and a curse into their lives. You see how this is working? This is where you get extreme grace te- doctrine, um, which is actually becomes eventually a license for Christians to sin. Because God is not of uh, unbalanced. He's extreme in His grace, but his, his grace is balanced with His law. His grace is balanced with uh, the, His, his uh, understanding of holiness and righteousness. Do you understand what we're talking about here? So there's this tension that's going on. Um, And so I'm just trying to get you to understand, with this unseen realm, whatever is called a God that is not our God is a demon. Okay, There is no true holy angel of God that will ever receive worship. In fact, in the book of Revelation, there is an angel guide that John has... And the angel God is leading John through the book of Revelation and revealing to him and explaining things that are happening that John is seeing in in Revelation. John is so overwhelmed by the amazing revelations he receives, he bows down and he starts to worship the angel. And and, and understand, this is the Apostle John, you know. The Apostle John near the end of his life, and he bows down to worship an angel. And the angel says, do not do that. The angel had the fear of God. He knows what happens to any angel or man that receives worship. It does not go well with you. You know, like, don't do that, John. I am your fellow minister. I am just a fellow minister. Do not bow down and worship me. So um, we have to understand what's going on in the world when they worship false gods. They're they're demons. Uh, But they do somehow have access into this council like Satan but they're part of the um, accuser council, so to speak. So in the heavens, there is a, a different voice going on. Um, let's look at Acts, the book of Acts, to give you a New Testament example of what I'm saying here. Acts chapter 5. 
I'm going to give you an example of two Christians that entered into Satan's counsel. Okay. It did not go well with them. Starting with verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have now lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So what made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but you've now lied to God. So what had happened was, is Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a property. And just before this, Barnabas, and uh, Barnabas was a, a, a Levite, a priest, who had now uh, got saved. And I believe Barnabas is the writer of the book of Hebrews because uh, he has an understanding of the Hebraic roots and all of these things of the priesthood. <clears throat> but Barnabas sells the house, the property, and he gives all of the finances to the apostles. Now, that was his choice. There was no command to do this. There's no law. But Barnabas, his heart, he's an encourager, and he's very generous. And so he's, he gave everything to the church to be used for the kingdom of heaven. So everyone praised Barnabas, and it's like everyone's talking, wow, Barnabas did this, you know. Now Ananias and Sapphira are thinking to themselves, wow, wouldn't it be awesome for everyone in the church to praise us and to honor us? You know, just like Barnabas, everyone's talking about Barnabas. You know, they can talk about us like that. So what they did is they sold their property. They kept part of it for themselves. Peter says it's okay to keep part of it for yourself. Yeah. There's no law. They, they could have kept 100% for themselves, you know. Uh, that, that there's no law there binding them, but the, this is what they did. They gave part of it to the apostles and said, this is all of it. Mm. They, they lied. Mm. And they made out that they'd given 100% to the church, but Peter gets revelation from God about what's really happening. And he says, you are, God, you are lying. You've lied not to men. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. So understand they're not getting in trouble because they kept part of it for themselves. They're getting in trouble because they lied. They said that they gave everything, but they didn't. And they are lying publicly before the leaders of the church, before the church, and there was a hope of being glorified, mm -hmm. being praised. Okay. It says here, that Ananias, with the full knowledge of his wife, kept part of the money for himself. And Peter then says, Ananias, Satan is the one that filled your hearts so that you would lie to the Holy Spirit. So this is what happened. There is a table, a council table that you can sit at. Ananias and Sapphira sit at the table with Satan. And Satan was counseling them, and they listened to his counsel. Because Satan filled their heart to do this, and they were in agreement, and which means not just with each other, they were in agreement with Satan. Do you see how that's working then? So that ended into that, and, and in the end, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. This is New Testament. This is not Old Testament. When Ananias heard this, he fell down, he died. Great fear seized all who heard of what happened. Mm -hmm. Then the young man carried, came forward, they wrapped up his body, carried him out to be buried. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this really the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the Spirit of God? Now, they didn't know that they had been filled by Satan. They didn't know that they were actually lying against God himself. And they were testing the Holy Spirit. But they were. Look, Peter said, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. 
They're going to carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The fear of the Lord came in the church. The fear of the Lord, it says, is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of true spiritual knowledge. And remember, in the counsel of God, all these angelic beings and all of these false gods, uh, but actually, ultimately, they fear God. They tremble. They know who God is. Okay. So now let's have a look at the book of Zechariah. Just trying to say that there that you can tune in to this council and walk before this council or walk before the council of the Lord. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 3. Starting with verse 1. It's getting hot. Uh, then he showed me... Now, now Zechariah has these dreams at night time. And very powerful prophetic dreams. And, and the book of Zechariah is made up of these dreams. These are prophetic dreams that he would release to the people of Israel. To Zerubbabel who was the governor of Israel. And to Yeshua... Uh, the high priest. At that time, his name is Joshua here in the English Bible because actually his name is Yeshua, Jesus. But um, he doesn't really represent Jesus in this story. Okay. So then he, that is the angel that was leading Zechariah through the visions and, and dreams and giving him understanding of what's going on. This angel was interpreting for him. The angel shows me Joshua, the high priest. Standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right side to accuse him. So here we have, Zechariah is now entered into the heavenly council. He's entered into the courtrooms of heaven. He sees the high priest, Joshua, standing before the throne of God, the judgment seat of God. And I'm going to get my left and right correct because I'm looking at you guys. It's different when I turn around, okay? So, left hand is this side. That's the devil. That's Satan. And that's the right. Because remember, I'm facing towards you. Okay. God's facing this way. Okay, the left hand of God in Scripture, for example, the sheep and goats prophecy of Matthew 24. Yeah. At the end of days, God's going to get all of his people and he's going to separate them into two groups. And one group will be the sheep and one group will be the goats. And the sheep get on the right hand side where Jesus stands. The goats get on the left hand side. The goats then he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And then the sheep he says, enter into the paradise that I prepared for you. Okay, so make sure you're one of the sheep and not one of the goats, by the way. Because many say, Lord, Lord, and they never knew him. There'll be people that think that they're truly Christian, people that think that they're truly the servants of the Lord, and they're going to find out that they're goats. Mm. So make sure you're... So the devil is on the left-hand side. The angel of the Lord, when you study theology, this is what we call a Christophany. Christophany is when in the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed. Mm. They're also called theophany, theo for God. In the Old Testament, God reveals himself in many ways, but God has never been seen by man. God as God. And in fact, Jesus himself said, No one has ever really seen the Father but the Son, and whoever has seen the Son has seen the Father. So whenever God has been revealed in a form that people tangibly can see, it's actually the Son, Jesus Christ. That's why... The Theophanies are Christophanies. The angel of the Lord, whenever he appears, for example, in the burning bush, Moses sees the burning bush that's burning but not burning. You know, like it's not being destroyed. 
And, and then the angel of the Lord is there speaking to him and says, Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And, and, and so the angel of the Lord is now receiving worship. Because Moses takes off his shoes and bows down. No angel receives worship, only God. So the angel of the Lord, whenever he comes in the Old Testament, he always doesn't just receive, he commands worship. And whenever he speaks, he speaks in first person as the Lord. Just giving you a bit of a theological understanding of what we're saying here. So the angel of the Lord that Zechariah sees is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in the New Testament has a name. He's called our advocate. The advocate is our defense lawyer. By the way, the Holy Spirit is called the Paracletes. Paracletes means to come alongside. It's a legal name for the advocate. So the work of the Holy Spirit is the same as the work of Jesus. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit is just doing what Jesus is doing. And then when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we follow the Holy Spirit, then we'll be doing what Jesus is doing. Do you understand how this works? That's why those that follow, are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. Because as we follow the Holy Spirit and do what the Holy Spirit's doing, we do what Jesus is doing and we become like Him. Okay. Just explaining some stuff here. Now this is interesting. Zechariah, who represents us, is standing here watching what's going on. He's seeing and hearing what is going on in the law courts of God. In the council of heaven. Can I tell you this? Here is Joshua the high priest, dressed in dirty rags. We'll get into that soon. Where was Joshua that night when Zechariah was having a dream? Was Joshua literally in the throne room of God? I think Joshua...